Alright guys, welcome back to you Formula 1 news. Mercedes have finally figured out what caused George Russell's engine to fail during the Australian Grand Prix and it's better news than they originally thought. It does not seem like there is a severe reliability concern with the Mercedes power unit and rather an incredibly unfortunate chain of events led to this circumstance that they do not expect to repeat in the future. Very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always, almost at 21,000 subs. First of all, Carlos Sainz's penalty right to review has been dismissed by the FIA. This is not a massive surprise. I didn't really think they had a chance to try and get this overturned, but they attempted to get the five second penalty signed to us had it after taking out Fernando Alonso at the Australian Grand Prix in the final restart of the Grand Prix to get reversed. That did not happen and they decided to uphold the decision. Now, was Science's penalty justified or not? I think the community in general is very much 50-50 on this one, but in fairness, the other incidents, the Gasly and Ocon incidents, the Sergeant de Vries incident, which were not given any penalties or in Sargent's case not even investigated were definitely also relevant for penalties I would say if Sainz's was for sure and of course there was no consequence for Alonso anyway because the order was reset after the third red flag or whatever it was of the Grand Prix so the review lasted two and a half hours today they eventually threw it out and said the following there is no significant and relevant new evidence or new element I suppose is what Toby Gruner says which was unavailable to the parties seeking the review at the time of the decision concerns. The petition is therefore dismissed. And this was a very entertaining uh, dismissal, actually, from the FIA. And they did actually give some good reasons. Can you believe it? Now, that's not to say the FIA isn't inconsistent. They are. And the fact that they had this penalty kind of upheld, but didn't even give a penalty to Gasly and certainly didn't even investigate the DeVries situation does raise questions. So Ferrari introduced three additional elements here. The telemetry data of Science's car, his witness statements, and some other witness statements as well. They also tried to look at a crash, I think, between Perez and Massa back in 2014, where, um, and they said there was a precedent there, but the steward said, no, that case is actually quite different, so it's not relevant to the matter. So what Ferrari said was that telemetry data showed that, uh, well, they basically submitted the telemetry data of science's breaking and everything. Now, first of all, the FAA already had this. This wasn't exactly brand new, and as they say here, the telemetry data presented in the petition is at best ambiguous, and in our view, did not ex exculpate science, but in fact corroborated our decision that he was wholly to blame for the collision. He says he braked harder but could not stop the car because of cold tyres. He states further that a slow formation lap contributed to the cold tyres. Those are two points, but even if that is true, there is no evidence to dismiss this case. The conditions of the track and the tyres were something that every competitor needed to take into account and adapt to. In trying to brake late while racing Gasly, he adopted the risk that he, as a driver, would lose control of his car. In this case, the risk material realize with the consequence that a collision with Alonso ensues for which a penalty follows. He also, they also mention specifically here, his witness statement in essence states how poor the grip was and how the sun was in his eyes. But logic would dictate that the position of the sun would have equally impacted other drivers too. It is not a justifiable reason to avoid the penalty and they dismiss the final part of things either. So I'm not surprised by this. I do wonder if they might have had a better chance had they have tried to say, well, look, these other incidents weren't punished. So what about our incident itself because you know they didn't submit anything new and the FEA well within their rights to just say well the point of these right for reviews is to bring additional evidence to the table Ferrari didn't so nothing is going to change even if they had a fair point if they didn't add anything new it could just be dismissed anyway and the community seems to think that science's penalty was kind of 50 50 most people reckon that Gazi should probably have got a penalty for the Ocon incident and a lot of people say that it should surely have been a penalty for Sargent which wasn't even investigated so the inconsistency is definitely still there. Ferrari have been, I think, somewhat unfortunate to get penalised when the other cases didn't. But maybe if they'd have said to the FIA, look, you didn't penalise anything for these cases, why are we getting penalised? Maybe Ferrari thought that if they said that, they'd be like, all right, fair enough, maybe we will penalise them, or at least we'll penalise sergeants, but wouldn't have taken it away from science anyway, so maybe that wasn't the wisest approach. But intrigued to your thoughts in the comments below. Ferrari did respond and say, we acknowledge the FIA decision. We are naturally disappointed. We felt like we had provided sufficient, significant new elements for the FIA to re-examine the decision. However, we're respectful to the process, etc, etc. I don't really know if they really expected this to be overturned, but they tried and they pretty unanimously failed. Let's talk about Aston Martin as well, because lots of discussion on the new engine regulations coming in for 2026. Helmut Marko has given some thoughts on Red Bull powertrains, the kind of partnership they have with Ford going forwards, talking about the current feedback is very good, the reliability will also be good, and saying that Ford is helping them a lot. The engines are getting ready to go, and look, it's a few 
years out at this point, but every team is already working on their 2026 powertrains, such as Audi as well. They're hiring new people. They're very confident in their Audi power unit from 2026. So definitely want to keep your eyes on, right? Audi are here very early to the party and they don't have to develop anything else for the next few years apart from that 2026 power unit. So come the new regulations in 26, they might have a rocket ship engine, which would be quite exciting for Formula One, but also Honda are coming in. The question is though, the big question about Honda, who are they going to partner with? Are they going to buy Alpha Tauri and do a Honda Works team? Obviously, they decided to quit and Red Bull were like, I'm fed up of you guys messing around here. We're going to go the Ford route. And Honda have done a great thing for Red Bull over the last few years, saving them for the depravity of McLaren. But Honda went back into the sport again because now it's popular and Honda feel like it's actually worthwhile. And they apparently are going to partner with Aston Martin. Those are the current negotiations ongoing and this makes a lot of sense. Frankly, if you're Aston Martin, you're never going to be, I don't think, a world beater, never really going to be a championship challenger if you're not a works team in full control of everything you do. Aston Martin, with all the facilities, all the investments, they will want to become independent from Mercedes. They won't want to buy Mercedes power units. They won't want to buy Mercedes gearboxes. They won't want to buy Mercedes rear suspension going forwards. They will want to do it all themselves because they've invested the resources to make that happen. And if you want to actually challenge for championships, that is the way you've got to do it fundamentally. So a potential partnership with Aston Martin and Honda is a very interesting and exciting prospect for the next set of regulations that they will effectively split from Mercedes over the coming years and Honda will come in to make the engines for Aston Martin and partner up there and maybe even make engines for the rest of the grid. Now look, Alonso, if he's still competing in 2026, might be like, oh my god, Honda, please no, after the McLaren days. But still, I think this is a good idea, to be honest, for Aston Martin. And they've been making some good decisions, it must be said, over the past few years. We don't know if this is going through. It's early reports, early negotiations. There's a long lead time here, but Honda are making, they've signed up to make engines for 2026. So they've got to find someone to sell them to. And it makes sense for Aston Martin to become less reliant on Mercedes, in my opinion. And especially because you look at their straight line speeds, this is just the differences, 2022, 2023 straight line speeds. Every car this year is slightly faster than last year. Ferrari significantly so, but they've had to sacrifice a lot of their performance in the corners, Ferrari, to get to this increased straight line speeds. Mercedes have achieved a fair increase as well. I think one of the highest percentage increases outside of Ferrari without sacrificing so much elsewhere. But Aston Martin, still the slowest car on track in a straight line, about 9 kph slower than Red Bull. And Haas are kind of sneaky rapid as well, which is another interesting point to keep your eyes on. Let's talk about Mercedes and their engine failure at the Australian Grand Prix, because lots of concerns really. The first three races, Lano Norris had an issue with his power unit in Bahrain. The pneumatics weren't working properly. Lance Stroll had an issue with his Mercedes power unit in Saudi Arabia. And then George Russell's engine blows up. So lots of concerns for Mercedes. Wow, is their engine no longer reliable? So they tried to do the research into this and figure out what exactly was going wrong. They took them about two weeks, really, two, three weeks to figure out what caused the failure, what exactly has gone wrong with the engine and whether it can be saved. Initially, Amos said here from Andreas Haupt that they thought the engine could be saved. The team hopes the engine is not lost, but the engine is definitely lost. The question is, can the ERS, can the other components still be saved? But the IC is definitely dead and that will be replaced. Of course, that's not good news, but it's not exactly a surprise given the state of the engine explosion that was had and the fire that came out the back of the car. So they figured out. Now, Toto Wolff initially said after the Grand Prix that it seemed like one of the cylinders was at fault here and that they've looked into this and they figured out that a foreign part got mixed up in the combustion process, which ultimately led to a drop in performance and the associated failure. A fragment was responsible for this. So a fragment of something or other, the engine ingested the debris into a cylinder, forcing failure. People are joking about debris, debris, he's still at Mercedes, all this stuff, so, hiding inside the engine somehow. The debris comes from a component that is not part of the sealed area of the engine. So this is obviously a concern. How is it possible that a piece of debris from some other part of the car that came off or from, you know, was just picked up on track because bits of carbon occasionally fly off. The cars are sturdy, but not always the case. And either something came from outside the car and somehow got into the engine components or something just fell off from another part of the car and somehow got inside the engine, which shouldn't really be possible. But um, you'd think that's an easier problem to solve than if the engine itself is actually unreliable because the technicians have declared the combustion engine and the associated elements have been lost. The turbo, the MG UH is all dead. So that's not looking good, of course. And that does mean that penalties will be coming down the line for Russell at some point in the future. But every driver is going to take four engines, right? So it might not be a massive deal, all things considered, because every team is probably going to go to four engines. Might not happen for everyone, but most teams will. And they got three races with one engine. It's not the end of the world. Not ideal, of course. The battery, the power electronics, 
might be able to be saved, but Russell's car will be fitted with a new engine in Azerbaijan, and, you know, probably penalties will come as a result. So the thing is, for Mercedes that is positive, it doesn't seem like this is a reliability problem with the engine. It doesn't seem like the cylinder just decided to give up the ghost and call it a day, and the engine exploded, because either they're pushing it to the absolute limit, or Mercedes have lost their way in terms of reliability, which does seem kind of unlikely after the season they had last year. And I imagine Mercedes are kind of happy that it's not an actual reliability issue. It's more like something somehow got dislodged elsewhere and found its way into the engine. That you would think is an easier problem to resolve to ensure that doesn't happen again than it resolve actual reliability problems with the power unit itself. But still, how does that happen, right? This seems to me like an incredibly unfortunate turn of events that somehow a piece of debris gets inside the engine, inside the cylinder from outside of the engine itself, which is pretty remarkable how that would even occur. I'm sure they're trying to figure out what they can do, whether it's casing, whether it's a kind of protective layers to stop that in the future. But it just seems like this is incredibly unlikely turn of events. And uh, yeah, Russell's weekend, despite going so well, then the red flag came out after he'd pitted under the safety car, which was a great decision, I thought. And he might have been out of battle of a stop into the end. Unlikely, but you never know. On that alternate strategy, the red flag kind of screwed him over. And then the engine just had a very rare failure, it seems. And uh, well, gave up the ghost for the Grand Prix. So not the end of the world for Mercedes. The Mercedes power unit probably is still as reliable as it was last year. And this was a probably a freak event. But we'll see because every Grand Prix so far, there's been something going on with a Mercedes power unit. Baku will be a pretty big test because, of course, a very power intensive circuit down that back straight. Just one thing to close out the video here with the paddock building for the Las Vegas Grand Prix coming up in what is it? November is being currently built. Here are some early images of what that exactly looks like. So the track, of course, is going to be a street circuit, but they're building some permanent facilities because they're going to be in Las Vegas for a long time to come. And this is what the paddock looks like. So at least what the building is going to look like. So just some early images of that. But very much enjoyed your thoughts on all this stuff in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care and I'll see you next time.